just for girls, just for us. Um, and I'm uh, Jacqueline Razov, and I'm one of the gynecologists at Valley uh, Medical Group, and my office is in Fairlawn. And um, at the end, we'll give you uh, contact information for um, how to reach me if you need to, you know, schedule an appointment. All right, so here are some of the goals for tonight. So in general, we'll kind of just review um, some of the physical changes that you can expect um, throughout the, you know, time of puberty. Um, hopefully encourage, uh, you know, being able to talk about this time a little bit more comfortably. Um, we'll have a chance to ask questions and hopefully have a little bit of fun. All right, so, so this is a very kind of important point. Um, you know, these are averages of when, you know, puberty happens um, and girls are a little bit more mature than, than boys. So we start a little bit earlier and it really can be from age, you know, 18 up to 13. And the important thing to know is your timeline is your timeline, right? So um, you can't necessarily rely on what's happening with your friends. Um, you just kind of have to see what happens with your own body. And, you know, it could just all be within the realm of normal if it's within that time range. So there's a ton of things that are happening in, in your body. And then, you know, we'll kind of go over some of the main ones that, that we think are important. So briefly reviewing anatomy, um, going over um, so breast growth, uh, changes in your hair, your skin, um, some tips on social media, um, how to deal with body shape uh, changes and height changes, mood swings, some hygiene and uh, safe touch reminders as well. All right, so this is kind of a really technical picture. I just wanted to point out some basic anatomy. Um, so can you guys see my um, pointer? Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right, so this right here is the front of your body and this is the back of your body. You can see like the um, tailbone over here. And this is in general, like a side view. This is the urinary bladder. This is the uterus or the womb. And this is the um, rectum and the anus. And this really slide just kind of goes to show that you, you know, girls have three openings in general, right? So we have, you know, the opening where we pee out of, we have the vagina, which is the middle opening. And then you have the anus, which is the opening for moving your bowels, AKA pooping. All right. So I'm sure you guys all know about, you know, menstruation or periods, but what is it? Like, why does it happen? Um, so basically a period is just some blood and a small amount of tissue that's released from this inner lining of your uterus that comes out of the vagina. And it typically happens, you know, once a month, um, but not quite in the beginning. And we'll talk about that. Um, so I just want to kind of go over this right here is that opening that I mentioned before, which is the vagina. And here's that inner lining of the uterus, which is what ends up shedding every month when you get your period. And this is the, you know, the womb in general, which is meant to carry um, a baby uh, whenever that time is right for you. And here's the fallopian tubes. They're little, like, I like to call them little railroads that um, bring the egg into the uterus. And here are the ovaries that produce the eggs, okay? So every single month, um, an egg is essentially released from the ovary to prepare for potentially having a baby. And since, you know, this isn't the time of life for you guys to be doing, you know, having a baby at the, um, the uterine lining ends up shedding. And that's really kind of what's, you know, preparing nutrients and shedding, um, for, sorry, preparing nutrients for um, potentially a baby. All right. Um, so again, if there's no fertilized egg, essentially the lining ends up breaking down and you'll have a bleed. And then I just wanted to mention kind of an interesting fact. So um, boys actually make new sperm every single month, but women, girls, we're actually born with the total number of eggs that we're ever going to have. Actually, you know, during development, even when, you know, during pregnancy, when a girl baby is inside the belly, she already has all the eggs that she's ever going to have. And there are hundreds of thousands of eggs that we're born with. All right, so when do we expect the period to start? So you know, the first kind of change that happens is actually the breast development. And typically the period happens about two years later. So again, we have a, a really wide range, like eight to 15 years old. And like I mentioned before, in the first, you know, couple of years even, or months, the period is not necessarily every single month. It does take your time and your, you know, takes your body a little bit of time to sort of um, get into a, you know, a cyclical pattern. 
So it takes some time for the brain, the hormones in the brain, which are these chemical messengers that essentially communicate with the ovaries to then, you know, start the cycle and become a little bit regular. So don't be worried if it's a little off in the beginning, um, but on average, it's every like 21 to 34 days. And on the bottom, you can see some of these apps that we have. Um, I think it's always a good idea to track. I, I personally use the Clue app. I think it's really nice and easy, um, just so you can kind of keep track of your symptoms and your periods, because otherwise it's really very difficult to do so. All right, and the other, you know, the other little clue that may happen is um, some vaginal discharge that can happen, you know, which is basically kind of like mucus that's secreted from the vagina, and you can see it on your underwear. And it usually begins about six months, even up to a year before the period comes. So that's just like another clue. And for moms, you know, when is the time to sort of get concerned if you're not seeing a period? So I would say by age 16, if your daughter hasn't had a period, or if you, you know, notice breast development, but then it's been about three years since then and still no period, that's when I would go in to potentially get evaluated either with the pediatrician initially or straight to the OB, OBGYN office. Okay, so what should you do when you first get your period? Um, so the first thing, you know, talk to your mom or any adults that you know, uh, or grown up that you trust. You have to just realize that essentially you're not going through this experience alone. Um, and every woman that you speak with, you know, will have gone through this experience and can help you. Um, and you know, what if this happens at school? I'm sure that's a big kind of uh, concern for everybody, but you know, you have your school nurse and she will help you out during this time. She'll definitely have a pad that you can basically just stick onto the underwear and it can absorb some of this fluid and protect your clothing. All right, so speaking of pads, so we have a couple of different ways that we can kind of, um, you know, a couple of different methods to sort of absorb the fluid. So the first thing that most people end up using is this pad over here. Um, it's sticky on the opposite side um, and you kind of just stick it to your underwear. Very, very, very simple to use and it keeps everything, you know, kind of clean and it keeps it from soaking through your, your clothes. And then whenever you feel comfortable, if you ever want to, there's another thing called a tampon. Um, which goes, you know, into the vagina. Um, so it really just requires somebody to teach you how to use it and make sure that you're, you know, taking it out every couple of hours and staying very, very hygienic. And then um, how much blood is normal? So that's kind of a question that a lot of people have. So typically the period lasts about five to seven days. Um, it could be a little bit longer, it could be a little bit shorter, really kind of depends on the person. Um, and the flow can, can really depend. Typically you have a couple of heavy days and then it, it gets a little bit lighter towards the end. On average, they say like two to four tablespoons of blood. Um, but typically I say to my patients, like if the period is lasting longer than seven days, if the bleeding is so much that you're going through this pad, like soaking through it more than once an hour, starting to pass clots, which are basically just formed, you know, pieces of blood like that are in some, like a ball um, and they feel like they're really, really large, you know, that's when you want to come to the OBGYN and get evaluated because, because that's too much bleeding. Um, and we don't want you to have, you know, all of that bleeding every single month and then potentially become low in iron and anemic. Um, any questions so far? All right, so how does it feel? Um, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. You may feel kind of yucky. Um, so in general, we, you know, there's something called cramps. So it's a lower, lower belly kind of pain or tightening, like a stomach ache in the lower belly. Um, you know, it can happen a couple of days before your period, which just can be a sign that the period is coming um, and it can last throughout your, your menstrual cycle. And some of the things that you can do about it, like the first thing I would, I would make sure is to get you know, good exercise and a healthy diet. Sometimes yoga, stretching, and those kinds of, you know, even taking a walk outside can be significantly helpful um, to help reduce pain. And then, you know, of course, using you know, heating pads and things like that, that's kind of the first line. Um, and they, you know, they call this PMS, so premenstrual um, syndrome. And it's basically just emotional and physical changes that you go through when you get your period. 
and it can include a lot of symptoms besides just this this pain and this feeling conclude moodiness. So mood swings up and down, feeling sad, anxious, tearful, um, feeling like your belly is a little bit bloated or a little bit gassy, and then some acne. Um, and then it typically does go away after the first couple of days for, of your period. Some of the other signs of puberty. So we talked a little bit about um, breast growth. So you basically start with breast buds and then you get like that first mound and the, then you get like, um, you know, more, more uh, breast tissue and finally adult breast tissue. The same thing happens with the pubic hair. Um, so breasts, I just kind of want to emphasize, um, no one is perfectly symmetrical. Um, most women have, you know, one that may be a little bit bigger than the other, and that is actually completely, completely normal. Uh, the nipples also tend to get a little bit darker and that's also completely, completely normal. The pubic hair will start to grow as well as other hair on your body, like your armpits, even arm hair and leg hair will increase in thickness in um, the color uh, can become a little bit darker and everything like that. And your body shape changes in general. So your hips are gonna get more curvy, more wide and um, some growth spurts. So some changes in height as well. And uh, this is just a picture of a training bra. So you may, you know, when you start to have some breast development, it may be a good idea to go and start getting a training bra just for a little bit of extra support because the breasts can be tender, especially during the time of the, of the period. So this is just a cute little um, cartoon that um, I really liked. So this is a mom and a daughter shopping for a bat mitzvah dress and they picked one out. Um, she's not sure and she wants to try on the one that she tried on 10 minutes ago. But by the time she goes to try it on, it already doesn't fit. It's kind of a joke because you know the changes don't happen that quickly, but it kind of can feel that way sometimes. So just this, you know, hopefully this prepares you just a little bit more. So this is just like a daily hygiene checklist. Um, I'm sure most of you guys know this, but you want to kind of every single day, take a look, smell your armpits, make sure they smell fresh. If there's any kind of, you know, bad odor or anything like that, you just want to put on some deodorant. And these are the things that could be happening soon. You obviously want to make sure that your clothes um, look clean. If there's anything on them, you change them. Your face, your nose is clean. Um, you know, you brushed your hair that morning. Um, and you always want to make sure you have on a clean pair of underwear. All right, so some of the skin changes, um, it's actually hormonal and normal for the oil in your skin to actually increase on the face, on the scalp, and more sweat. So that's why we kind of talked about deodorant and things like that. So some of the methods is try to um, help with the acne that could develop. And again, this is very variable. Some people don't have it at all, and some people have it really, really significantly. Um, but these are some of the first line things that you could do. So you obviously want to keep your skin clean. You want to wash your face every single day. Avoid the temptation to essentially pick at pimples that come because that really can leave some scars that can last for a long time. Um, and then you want to just, you know, be, you know, your healthiest self. You want to drink a lot of water. You want to eat the healthiest possible diet. And I have another slide on that. Um, you want to keep the face um, just clean. You want to wash, you know, wash your hair and keep it away from your face. Um, even changing your pillowcase regularly and washing that regularly. And just realize, you know, it is common to have acne. Um, it's going to happen to you, your friends. Um, and it's just, uh, just a part of growing up, unfortunately. Um, if necessary, there's actually a ton of, of products that you can use over the counter. You can buy a CVS or even Amazon and things like that. Um, and face washes that really, really could be effective. effective. Um, and if it gets to the point where, you know, it's kind of happening outside of the menstrual cycle throughout, you know, throughout the month and it's getting worse, the doctor that you may want to kind of consult with is the dermatologist. And also even the OBGYN, because sometimes our, our medications can help with the acne as well. Now mood swings, also completely, completely normal. And um, what I suggest is just really talking to your mom and your family about it because you know they'll understand. Um, mood swings just mean exactly what it sounds like, a pendulum where you're going from happy to sad to tearful to upset you know, in seconds. 
Um, and it's very, very normal. And a lot of it is, you know, outside stress and things that are going on in our lives, but a lot of it is also hormonal. Um, so again, mom will understand or whoever you choose as your trustworthy adult, talk to your friends um, and just kind of be honest and open and it'll make things go a little bit smoother. So in terms of diet, um, you know, you do your best, of course, but we got to tell you how to be the healthiest, healthiest self. So you want to make sure that you're getting enough protein, that you're choosing, you know, whole grains, um, you're choosing complex carbohydrates instead of simple ones. Um, so I'm talking about like brown rice instead of white rice and, um, you know, um, whole wheat pasta instead of plain, things like that getting your dairy in, in terms of vegetables, you know, not everybody likes every kind of vegetable, but you just want to think about trying to make your plate look very colorful. That's what I always tell people. And I try to do that myself as well. If you're seeing all the colors of the rainbow, you're doing a really good job. Same with your fruits. And you want to kind of avoid, you know, the vending machine as much as possible, or even try, try to make healthy choices at the vending machine. Um, trying to skip the soda, the chips, um, drinking water instead of that. Um, and then we all, you know, talked about avoiding processed foods and overly sugar foods, sugary foods, because those things honestly can make the acne worse and can make you feel a little bit more bloated and worse, especially during the time of your period. Um, this is just some, you know, an idea of some conversation starters, you know, this can even be something that you guys do after tonight's presentation, just like a two minute interview from daughter to mom and mom to daughter, some questions that you may want to ask, um, you know, daughter to mom asking like, what, well, how old were you when you got your period? How long did it take for your periods to essentially become regular? Did you need any medications? Did anyone help you through this? I think in general, you know, our generation and the generations coming are a little bit more open and, um, and the moms are, you know, talking to their daughters a little bit more and giving more information than what people used to do. So I think that's actually really, really wonderful because people had to go through this alone a lot more often back then. Um, and some questions for moms asked, you know, your daughter, just trying to get involved in, you know, their personal life, what's important to them, finding out who's their best friend if you don't already know, What's your favorite activity um, and those kinds of things. All right, so this is a very, very important slide um, because this is the Gardasil or HPV vaccine that's actually advised, particularly in your age group. And this is a vaccine that protects against the virus called HPV, which is incredibly, incredibly prevalent. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, and I'm sure the pediatrician as well, you know, we should treat this just like any other vaccine. So um, if you're going to get this vaccine at the, at the time between nine and 14, it's only two shots. If you're gonna get it later, it's actually three shots. And what it does is it, it's very safe and effective and it prevents against about 70% of cervical cancer and um, about 90% of genital warts. So it's actually one of the most effective vaccines that we have. And the only vaccine that I'm aware of that actually exists to prevent a potential cancer in the future. So cervical cancer typically happens with HPV that's untreated, that's left um, persistent for long periods of time, which can cause changes in the cervix. And one of the things to also know, you know, it used to only be approved for women up to the age of 26. So people were missing it. And now it got extended up to the age of 45 because it's so, so, so effective. So I'm actually vaccinating for the first time patients in their 40s um, and patients that have HPV for you know, many, many years at a time, getting the vaccine at that moment in their lives can actually help uh, get rid of the HPV and can help cure them. All right, so here are some you know, just social media guidelines um, for mom, you know, social media is a really hot topic. These are just, you know, some suggestions that may, may help. Um, you want to obviously kind of, you know, social media is going to be a part of their lives, but you want to limit it and, and kind of include obviously face-to-face -face interactions, friends and family, other activities, physical activities, sports, you know, other hobbies that, that you know, you may have in addition to schoolwork and obviously very, very importantly, getting some sleep. 
Um, I know a lot of a lot of people are on their phones, on their Instagrams, on their Facebooks late at night, and it could really be interfering with getting that full eight hours of sleep because you guys are waking up so early for school. You you want to be engaged with your child's online life. You know, maybe set up the account with them, um, see who they're friending, who they're following, what platforms they're they're using because there's new things coming up all the time. Um, one idea, you know, this may not work for everybody, but one idea is to sort of make the bedrooms a media free zone and make, you know, the office or another space specifically um, for social media or smartphones or doing schoolwork and things like that. Just separating it may make the bedroom a little bit of a more restful place. And, you know, of course, being sensitive to your children's moods and being prepared to sort of engage in discussions of anything negative going on as the result of social media. These are some steps to a positive self-image. So just a brief reminder, you know, every person is very, very, very different. It's important to be proud of who you are, be proud of your differences. It's good to be different than, you know, er than anyone else. Um, and you wanna kind of be grateful for the good things that you have and focus on the really good. You know, everyone is extremely, extremely unique. I wanna remind you guys that there, there is no ideal body type. Um, you know, what you're seeing on Instagram with the filters and, you know, the edited images, it can be very, very difficult to then, you know, look in the mirror and see something different. Um, but you have to realize that that's not real. And, um, you know, try not to let other people's idea or perception of how you look affect your own, um, you know, self-esteem. So you want to have, you know, start, try to develop some strong self-esteem and really try to realize that different is good and everybody is unique and beautiful in their own way. So this is just um, a slide talking about, um, you know, body safety rules, essentially. So private parts or anything that's, you know, covered by a bathing suit, you just want to make sure that if anyone or you know any person, whether it's on social media, whether it's in person, you know, even makes you a tiny bit uncomfortable in regards to anything like that, you just want to have like a really good safety network, some grown-ups that you trust, you know, older siblings, um, teachers, whoever that person may be. But think about who that may be for you, and just you know know that you can reach out to that person. So these are just you know some common questions that that come up on these um, forums, but of course if other ones come up, I'd be really happy to answer them. But you know when should you even start scheduling an appointment with an OBGYN? I get that question all the time. Um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends between the ages of 13 and 15. I know a lot of moms and and kids may be very concerned about you know doing a pelvic exam or. Um, you know, traumatizing them in any kind of way. But a lot of the first visits, especially if, you know, there's nothing that we think is going on anatomically, it really doesn't require a pelvic exam. It could be just a visit coming in for discussion of puberty and what changes are normal, what's not, talking about the periods, talking about acne, um, talking about anything that, that may, make, may make you comfortable. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to include a pelvic exam. Even if there are things that are going on like irregular bleeding or heavy bleeding and sometimes we have to evaluate, we can do an ultrasound and there's different types of ultrasounds. There's one you know, with a probe that goes inside the vagina and there's also one that's on top of the belly. And that's the preferable one in this age group, right? So we just make sure that you have a full bladder, you come to the office and then we're most of the time able to see the structures we need to see with just an ultrasound above the belly. So I just wanted to kind of tell you to not worry about that particular fact. Um, and then, you know, if the period cramps are really, really bad and the things I had mentioned like yoga and exercise and heating pads really aren't working, the next step um, is actually to take some Advil and Tylenol kind of um, around the clock. So this kind of thing, I, I never even learned until I got into medical school but Advil, which is kind of counterintuitive, it actually decreases the amount of bleeding during a period and it helps with the pain, of course. So typically if somebody's having like really bad two, three days to the point where they're skipping school and not able to do their normal activities, that is what I'd, I would recommend. Um, like a higher dose Advil every six hours, knowing which days are gonna be the worst. And that's kind of the first line. 
and Tylenol you can take in between when you're, when you're not yet due for the next Advil dose. And you know, the next question, when can I use a tampon? It's really whatever, whenever you feel comfortable. You just kind of have to be taught by somebody who's used it before, you know, how to use it properly, how to maintain hygiene. You cannot lose a tampon in the vagina. That's it's not possible. So if there's any concern ever, you come and see us, see the gynecologist, and we'll we'll tell you and we'll take it out if there's any issues at all. And you know, that's pretty much all that I have. Um, Thank you so much for listening. And please, please, please tell me what questions you guys have. So while everybody else puts questions in, I have a question. Yeah. Um, will I get my period at the same age that my mom did? Well, that's a good question. So I always ask about the mom's um, menstrual history because a lot of these things can um, sort of repeat themselves, um, but it's not necessarily going to be perfect like that. Like I mentioned, every single person is unique and different. So it's interesting to find out when, um, but it's not always going to be exactly at the same time. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? Throw them in the chat, throw them in the question, um, the Q&A. And, and if not, I'm actually putting my email address in to the chat right now um, if anybody thinks of anything. I'm just doing that right now. Sorry. Can't do two things at once. Back at valleyhealth.com. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to put my video back on. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, oh, I think we got a question. Oh, my mom got it at 11. I'm 12. When will I get it? So, again, you know, you may be a little bit later than mom, and that's totally, totally fine. Um, as long as, you know, the your breasts have developed, you know, within the next two, two years after that, you should be getting it. And if not, if it's gone really two, three years and you still haven't got it, you know, that's when you come in. You also want to make sure really that you're taking good care of yourself, that you're good, healthy weight. Sometimes if people are exercising way too much, or they're really, really skinny, um, you know, or doing sports really intensely running marathons, things like that, it really can take a lot longer to get your first period. So you want to be at a good, healthy weight um, and, you know, do some exercise, but don't go crazy with it. Thank you. Um, will this presentation be online? Yes. So um, I hopefully next week I will be able to get this presentation posted on Valley's website. Um, and I will also email it out to everybody who is registered for this. Okay. So that. Oh, okay. How do I know if my breasts have developed? Great question. That is a good question. So the first thing that you're going to see is something just called like a breast bud, like a little bit of extra tissue right in the center. The second thing that happens is like a little mat, like a, a mound that happens when you get a little bit more tissue. And I'm just going to actually, because that's a, such a good question. I'm going to pull up a picture of it so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Give me just one second. Good questions, guys. Okay, so I mean, this is more of just like a drawing than a picture, but it's coming from a textbook. So I like it. Oh, it's making me sign in for something. One second. Okay, I'm just going to make it bigger here and I'm going to share my screen. So this is, there's something called, you know, tanner staging, and it's, it's a way medically that we look at breast development and pubic hair growth. And, you know, prepubertal, you can see that this is, you know, kind of a flat surface. The first step is that you just get this breast bud and your breast is not elevated quite yet. And the next step is that you see a little bit of elevation in this little kind of mound here. The next step, you have an areolar mound and it's also going to get darker. And then finally, the last stage is an adult contour. So, you know, it's a little bit maybe difficult um, to see, but the breast bud, that really, really tiny little difference is the first step.
Great. 